In this tutorial, I'll walk you through my custom workspace and brushes for Corel Painter 2023. After first exporting your own workspace, you can now load my custom workspace by going to Window, Workspace, Import Workspace. This is going to replace any customization that you have applied to Corel Painter with my own configuration. By default, the layout is condensed down to fit on a small display. If you are on a small display, feel free to spread the content out. If the palettes are disappearing at the bottom of the display, you can collapse the panels and palette drawers to make more room. You can also expand hidden panels by double-clicking on the Name tab to reveal more content. Some palettes may need to be extended vertically to show all of the content. You can drag from the bottom right to make the palette larger. If you're on a larger display, you can go to Window, Layout, Large Monitor to automatically distribute the content to accommodate a wider screen. Once you have arranged the content to fit your screen, save a custom layout so you can restore it again. Next, I'd like to give you a quick overview of my custom workspace. What's showing on screen is what I have deemed essential. There are other panels and features that I might use on occasion, but they don't need to be visible all the time. First, I have my brushes and media on the left. My color picker and other color related panels are located in the top right. In the bottom right, I have palettes for layers. In the middle of the workspace, beneath the properties bar are common shortcuts that I use often. And a few specialty panels here and there that deal with specific workflows. There is more customization to my workspace than this, but this should at least give you an idea of the basic layout. If you accidentally close something, such as this brushes AR palette drawer, you can restore it from the window menu, palette drawers. Any missing content can be located in the window menu, but what may be faster is to reset the visibility and location of the palettes by going to Window Layout and then choosing Large Monitor, Small Monitor, or your custom layout. That will restore the layout to its default. There is a bug in Painter that may cause the icons in the custom palette to go missing if the custom palette is closed. In order to restore the palette visibility, you'll need to load one of the custom layouts or re-import the workspace. Because of this bug, I tend to collapse sensitive palette drawers or cover them with other palettes rather than close them. You can also feel free to tweak my workspace to better suit your needs. For example, if you are left-handed and you want the brushes to be on the right, that's fine. Just remember to save your customization as a layout. You'll also want to save a copy of the workspace by exporting it. Give your version of the workspace a unique file name to differentiate it from the original. Let's go to the Window menu, Custom Palette Organizer, and we'll take a look at the list of custom palettes I've created. I want to remind you that there should be a scroll bar here that is missing, so you have to use your up and down arrow keys to move through this list if you have a lot of custom palettes. You can rename the palettes and delete the ones you don't use. If you want to move my custom brush palettes into your own workspace, you can import the box files. The same goes for any custom media I have created, like papers, gradients, and flow maps. If I go to Preferences, Customize Keys, then you can see I have this custom key set that I saved. I've customized some of the shortcuts a bit. If we look under Edit, Free Transform, I have it set to Control T. The reason why I've done this is because in Photoshop and many other art applications, Control T is Free Transform, so it makes it easier to keep things consistent. I use Free Transform a lot, but I don't use tracing paper, which is what Control T usually controls. If you want to set any shortcuts back to their default, feel free to do that. You can restore all of the default keyboard shortcuts by choosing Default for the key set. In addition to choosing shortcut keys for the application menus, you can also assign keys to the palette options menus and the toolbox tools. There's also the other menu, which allows you to assign keys to some of the functions that are more obscure. We'll go back to the application menus and canvas. We'll look under perspective guides, and there are some more custom shortcuts here. P toggles the perspective guides visible and invisible, so you can cycle through the different modes, and then to activate or deactivate perspective guided strokes, you press Shift P. We'll be looking at what these guides can do a little bit later when we get into perspective. If we go to the brushes menu, then you can see that I set select previous variant to back quote or tilde. So that's just about it for my custom key set. You may notice that many of these shortcuts are also available as buttons in my custom palettes, because that makes it easier for me to demonstrate the steps I'm taking. For example, as I'm working, 
It's easier for me to reach down to my keyboard and hit the P key if I want to toggle between the perspective guides, but then I'm not able to show that on screen. Clicking on the perspective guides button gives my students a visual cue that I have activated a shortcut. I also want to remind you that you can select Corel Painter as your application in the Wacom tablet properties, and you can program a lot of the keyboard shortcuts to the buttons on your pen, tablet, and express key remote, or even a shortcut device like a Stream Deck. It's important to remember that every time you reset a workspace, import a workspace, or reinstall Corel Painter, you'll need to rerun the brush accelerator. If you look up in the properties bar under advanced, you'll see a red dot next to advanced brush controls. That means Corel Painter has not yet been optimized. Next, I'm going to explain the logic behind what I chose to feature in my workspace. You're probably wondering, why are the palettes arranged the way they are? Why are the features I chose more important than the features I have hidden? What types of tasks do I use these palettes for? Before I get into the individual content, I'll share why I have everything arranged this way. I happen to be right-handed, so having frequently used content located on the right requires less arm movement. For instance, I change my color and layers the most when I'm painting, so those are on the right. I change my brush a lot too, but less often than I would choose colors or layers. I use this workspace layout throughout all of my tutorials and courses. Some of the workspace elements might change over time, but for the most part, you can watch any of my lessons and the custom brush palettes are always going to be on the left, the color picker and layers are always going to be on the right. Consistency not only makes it easier for my viewers to follow along with me, but it increases my efficiency as well because I don't have to waste any time searching for content. In order to optimize my workspace, I've collapsed or hidden any content that I don't feel is essential to have visible at all times. The collapsed content is useful, but less commonly used, so it stays hidden until I need it. The remaining content has been closed or removed from the workspace, and while I might use some of it on occasion, much of what Painter can do isn't necessary for my painting workflow. However, don't let that discourage you from trying the other features yourself. We all have different ways of working, so feel free to add content that you feel is useful to your own version of the workspace. Now let's dig into why I chose some of this content. You can't paint without brushes, so it only makes sense to have them readily available. You should aim to build custom palettes of brushes that are useful to you, rather than having to search through the various categories and libraries for the brush you want. One of the worst things you can do is break your flow while painting. Don't make it a chore to find a brush or feature. I am using my own brush library to make it easier to find my custom brushes. You can also switch to the default painter library, which has many more brushes. We'll be going back and forth between these libraries a lot during this course. For your convenience, you can favorite any of the default painter brushes I use during this course to make them easier to find. Just click the heart icon next to the brush to help you find it. You can also filter to isolate these brushes at any time. In order to conserve space in the interface, I have created custom icons that show a small stroke or dab with the abbreviated name underneath. You can hover over the icon to see the full brush name. My custom brushes are sorted into palettes with corresponding brush categories to make it easier to locate different types of brushes. Because I rarely need more than a few categories open at the same time, most of the categories can be collapsed to conserve space. Some palettes may need to be expanded vertically to show the entire contents. You can drag on the right side of the bottom edge to make the palette taller. At the top are my rendering brushes, which are useful for adding paint. I have my blenders, which are for blending paint. Palette knives are flat brushes, some of which can be rotated. Effect brushes create special effects. And nature brushes are useful for painting landscape elements. Then there are media specific categories such as thick paint, watercolor, liquid ink, oil, hard media, inking, and texture. As you can see, everything is sorted and categorized nicely as if this were my desk. I can just open up a drawer, and if I want to work with some thick paint brushes today, I'll take those out. When I'm finished, I'll close the drawer to tidy up the workspace. These brushes are organized within each palette by priority. The top row contains the brushes I use the most. Brushes with similar behavior are grouped together in rows or columns. For instance, these brushes are all chalky and textured, so they're grouped together. And there is a column for the airbrushes. In the blenders palette, the brushes are grouped by look. 
The first column contains blenders that diffuse. There is a row of blenders that look scratchy. And all of the distortion brushes are grouped in the bottom row. Distortion brushes are not technically blenders, but they do mix the paint, so I have them grouped with the blenders. I get most of my paintings done with a handful of brushes, and to be honest, I have way more brushes than I'd ever need to use for one single painting. Many of these brushes are specialty brushes that I only use on occasion. For example, if I'm aiming for an oil painting style, I might choose brushes from my oily category. If I want to paint with palette knives, I have a whole collection of those. There is definitely a balance between having too many brushes and not having enough. This may look like a lot of brushes, and it is, but compared to how many default brushes are available, it still narrows down the choices quite a bit. Docked above the brushes are some common brush size shortcuts that can quickly resize your brush. These may be helpful when following along with me. For example, when I say choose a large brush, you can choose the large preset. These shortcuts were taken from the size library panel. I added custom preset sizes and icons. If you don't find this panel useful, feel free to hide it. Let's move over to the right side of the UI. Another feature that I use often is layers. In my particular painting technique, I use a lot of layers. I'm constantly manipulating stuff in the layers palette, creating new layers, changing the composite method, moving the layers around, merging them together, and so on. So naturally, the layers palette is a permanent fixture in my workspace. Grouped with my layers panel are some other composition tools, layout grid, and divine proportion. They can overlay useful guides onto the canvas. The color picker is another essential panel to have on screen, because I'm often choosing color more frequently than anything else. I have several different options for choosing color. I can use the default color picker, or I can select color using the mixer, the compact color panel, color set libraries, or the harmonies panel. Which panels I use depends on my workflow or sometimes my mood. I'll collapse the color panels and expand the mixer panel. What you are seeing is not the default mixer pad, but a custom mixer pad that I imported. Let's restore the default mixer pad from the panel options menu in the top right. Now the mixer pad resembles a traditional artist's palette. Much like its real world counterpart, you can use this mixture to create mixtures of color and load your brush with paint. This is somewhat of a specialty panel, so it can easily be hidden when not in use. I wanna go back to the panel options menu and I'm going to choose Restore URMB ARHSL. Unless you manually installed these mixer pads, they won't show up in this list. See the workspace installation instructions to learn how to do that. This custom mixer pad is used for color gamut masking, which is an advanced method for choosing color. Beneath the mixer, we have another compact color panel. This panel is meant to be used alongside the mixer as part of my color gamut masking workflow, but it can also be used on its own as a more compact way of choosing color. This panel features color ramp sliders, which are also repeated in the default color panel, so you only need one of the two color panels open. If you find that you never use the mixer or compact color, feel free to leave them out of your workspace once you've completed this course. Beneath that, we have color set libraries. Color set libraries are swatches of color that you can choose from, sort of like pre-mixed paint colors. In the default Corel Painter workspace, you'd normally see loads of colors here. But in my workspace, I have left the contents blank because I prefer to add my own color swatches. Again, this customization is part of my color gamut masking workflow. Moving down, there is the harmonies panel. You can use this panel to select harmonious colors. Moving down to the next row, paint layering, formerly known as stroke attributes, can change the way strokes build up when you overlap them. Color variability and color expression can vary the color of your paint as you're painting. Underpainting is a panel that's typically used for cloning, but what I use it for is to make slight adjustments to the brightness or color of a layer. This can be faster than applying effects from the effects menu. Now let's go back over to the left and let's explore some of the optional brush and media control palettes. This is the brushes and media selection area. At the top is a list of the recent brushes, which is a palette containing the last 10 brushes you painted with. This list can also be enabled in the regular brush selector, but I prefer to keep it visible on screen because it makes it easier to switch between all of the brushes used in a particular painting. You can clear this list by selecting a different brush library and then switching back. 
Beneath that, we have a grouping of icons and a custom palette that is called Brushes and Media. This gives us a few different options for choosing brushes and access to some of the most commonly used media panels. The first four buttons control the brush selection method. Currently, the brushes are being displayed as the first option called Stroke Preview. If I click the Stroke Preview button, it's going to hide and show that entire group of custom panels. This mode is called Stroke Preview because the palette contains the Stroke Preview at the top. The Stroke Preview shows us a preview of what the brush stroke might look like. If I cycle through a few brushes, you can see how the Stroke Preview hints at the brush behavior. I find this panel useful for previewing the effects of properties on a brush, but when it's not in use, I keep it hidden. I'll hide the Stroke Preview palette drawer, and then click on the next option, which is Panel Compact. This opens the Compact Brush Selector, which gives me an alternate way of selecting brushes. This mode shows a list of brushes, along with a dab preview and a stroke preview next to each brush name. You can also expand this palette, and the brushes will flow accordingly. This mode is here as an option for users of my workspace, but I do use it myself on occasion. I'll hide that mode, and I'll try the next mode. Panel Full View opens the Full View Brush Selector. This is yet another way to choose a brush. You can use this panel to access all of the brush categories and the brush variants at the same time. I find the Full View Brush Selector to be very helpful when I'm creating and managing custom brushes, so I keep it tucked away until I need it. Most of the time I'm using the Stroke Preview Brush Selection palette because I prefer to view my brushes as custom icons and it's a more efficient use of space. The final brush selection button opens a custom dabs palette drawer. These are a collection of tools that come in handy when working with captured dabs. The next six icons in the brushes and media palette open palette drawers for various types of media. These are specialty palettes that I only use with specific brushes or workflows. Let's start with gradient. If I click on that, the gradients palette drawer opens, giving me access to the gradients library and gradient properties. If you want to close that palette drawer, you can click on the close button, or you can click on the gradient shortcut once more. Next to that is a shortcut for patterns. This opens the patterns palette drawer. This can be handy to have available when you want to paint with pattern pens. The next button gives us access to the texture palette drawer, which has a library of textures. The next button in this row is for looks. Looks allow a single brush to have several different appearances. Or in other words, a look is a variant of a brush variant. For example, knife canvas looks a bit different than knife break, but they're using the same brush variant. The only thing that's changing is the paper grain. The last two buttons in this row open palette drawers for image hose nozzles and particle brushes. Before I can paint with image hose nozzles, I'll need to select a brush and a nozzle to paint with. Having the brushes grouped with the nozzles is a reminder that the two work together. I recommend only collapsing the palette drawer for this one because the icons can sometimes disappear. Resetting the layout will fix that. There is also a grouping of panels that can control the behavior of particle brushes. This can be useful when creating and modifying particle brushes. In the middle of my stroke preview brush selector is papers. The papers panel gives me access to various paper textures I can use to change the look of my brush or the surface I'm painting on. Brushes that will allow you to use paper grain have a paper grain flyout in the properties bar, which also gives you access to papers. But since I use this content so often, it's more convenient to have it in a palette rather than a flyout. Beneath papers is the grain panel. Grain gives us additional control over how our brushes can utilize the paper. The properties for random grain rotation and random grain position are especially useful because of how they add randomization to the brush. Beside papers is the flow maps panel. Flow maps can change the look of a brush in a similar way to papers. They allow liquid media like watercolor to flow in between the grain of the flow map. Flow maps can also influence the movement of particle brushes and the shape of dab stencils. Located throughout my workspace are shortcut panels that help me access commands that are buried in some of these menus. I have organized these commands by function or workflow. For example, I have general shortcuts, shortcuts that deal with brush and workspace management, and shortcuts that deal with layers. If I want to clear a layer, I can click on the Clear Layer button rather than using the keyboard shortcut or clicking through the menus. So from here on out, you shouldn't have to select much from the menus 
because a lot of the content we will be using is available as shortcuts in the workspace. Having these shortcuts readily available takes a lot of the frustration out of trying to remember where to find a command. Near the top of the UI is a custom palette drawer I created for some extra content. This contains the navigator and a few other palettes that I only use occasionally. Let's start with the navigator. I use this panel to get a smaller view of my artwork, which can be really helpful while you're zoomed in closely. Painter 2022 introduced a feature that lets you preview your image in grayscale in the navigator panel. It can be difficult to tell how light or dark a color really is, so this feature comes in handy for evaluating the value structure or the balance of light and dark in your painting. This is important because the correct balance of values in an image is crucial for rendering realistic looking subjects. The control to turn the grayscale preview on and off is a little buried in the panel options menu, so I recommend making a shortcut of it in the custom panel for quicker access. If you're using a recent version of Windows 10 or 11, you can also preview the canvas in grayscale using a simple keyboard shortcut of Windows Control C. Beneath that is a custom palette with some command buttons that are used with the mixer and the color set libraries. This is used in my color gamut masking workflow. And below that is a custom course palette with buttons that make it faster to revert templates and reset brushes. There is also a reset button, which is a script that both reverts the template and resets the brush in a single click. Be sure the script library is installed in the scripts panel if the reset button is not working. There are also a couple of buttons to record and play strokes. These may come in handy when we compare strokes with different properties. Next, I'll demonstrate with what I consider to be some of my essential brushes here in Corel Painter. Because I use them so often, all of these brushes will be located in my custom palettes. My most commonly used brush categories are located in the topmost palettes. And within each palette, the most important brush variants are typically arranged in the top left. Despite having so many brushes, I only use a handful of variants for a painting. The occasional specialty brush may be required to get a specific look, but the bulk of the work can be done with just a few brushes. Although some brushes are universally useful, which brushes are essential is often relative to the subject or style of the painting. For example, if I'm creating a painting in a watercolor style, then naturally I'd be using my watercolor brushes. If I were painting a landscape, the set of brushes I choose would be much different. I'll share my frequently used brushes first, followed by an overview of some of the specialty brushes and categories. Let's start with some airbrushes. The first variant is called Digital Airbrush. As with many of the brushes we will look at, this variant is based off of a legacy brush with the same name. I've tweaked this brush a bit, but otherwise it's quite similar to the soft airbrush found in the default painter brush library. Airbrushes are one of the oldest and most basic brushes one can use to create digital art, but they are still incredibly useful. The feathered edges and slowly building opacity make airbrushes perfect for adding form to objects and creating hand-painted gradients. This is one of many brushes that have been enhanced by adding the fluid paint properties which you give the brush more control over opacity with pen pressure. You can also apply paint layering to modify how the brush media blends with underlying paint. Let's set it to multiply. If I overlap strokes, I can build up my color darker without having to change anything in the color picker. To build up my color lighter, I could change the merge mode to screen. As you can see, this airbrush variant can be useful for tinting layers or adding lights and shadows. When working with this brush, you may also want to blend it with underlying colors using an appropriate composite method. Many of my brushes can utilize paint layering, so keep an eye out for the paint opacity flyout in the properties bar. The grainy airbrush is similar to the previous digital airbrush, but with the ability to use grain. If I change my paper grain to something with more contrast, and I increase the opacity of this brush, you can see that it has a soft edge with some texture throughout the stroke. I'll change my paper back to basic paper. Next is the glow brush, which has airbrush qualities. This is an amazing brush that can build up colors in a way that mimics natural light. My version of the glow brush is different from the default because it uses fluid paint with the merge mode set to screen instead of the glow brush plugin. 
You can also get some nice lighting effects using the color dodge merge mode. I use this brush a lot for creating lighting effects, but it's also great for enhancing the form of objects and adding rim highlights. We'll move on to another grouping. I'll select the sketching pencil. This is a fantastic pencil because you can tilt your pen to change the shape and opacity of the dab, allowing you to emulate shading with the side of a pencil. It responds very nicely to pen pressure. As you can see, I can create a nice gradient from dark to light by modulating my pressure. This is my go-to brush for sketching and pencil drawing because it has a superb look and feel. It also utilizes grain, which you can change to a different paper. I'll return to basic paper. The next brush we will look at is the smooth scratch board. The smooth scratch board responds nicely to pen pressure and creates a fully opaque stroke with smooth, sharp edges. This makes it ideal for inking and line art. I've added some stabilization to the brush to slow it down a bit which makes it easier to freehand draw smooth curves and straight lines. Occasionally, I may tweak the stabilization property to adjust the feel of this brush. Smooth fill also creates an opaque stroke with a smooth edge. It works well for blocking in layers. I use this brush to establish the silhouette of an object and then use other types of brushes to add form to it. You can use the dab profile to tweak the edges of this brush if you want the edges of your silhouette to be sharper or softer. Now let's check out a few textured brushes. First is chalk, which I find useful for adding texture to objects. You can get a lot of different textures by changing your paper. In the grain panel, random grain rotation is enabled, which allows the texture to overlap, creating a more organic result. Because this is a fluid paintbrush, you can also change the merge mode to get different buildup results. For a texture that is even more random, we could choose random chalk. That has both random grain rotation and random grain position enabled. You can see the difference if I overlap a few strokes. Random chalk works better for creating trees or bushes, whereas chalk is better suited for creating texture overlays because the grain pattern is more static. Random chalk can also utilize fluid paint, so I can change the merge mode to multiply, and then I can add some shadows to these trees without having to select a new color. Next, I will change the merge mode to screen, and I could use that same color to add highlights. Flat Captured uses a captured dab that can be swapped out for other dab shapes in the captured panel. I find this brush to be incredibly useful for painting foliage because it generates a wide variety of leaf shapes. Making the brush larger, increases the size of the shapes. Heavy pressure makes larger shapes that are more opaque, and lighter pressure makes smaller shapes that are more faint. And by modifying the dab effect, I can randomize the leaf shapes even more. Next is sponge. This brush has a spongy dab with a lot of detail. You can dab with this brush or overlap strokes to create a more intricate texture. If we make our brush bigger, the texture gets larger. If we make the brush smaller, the texture gets finer. Heavy pressure will give you a strong paper grain. Lighter pressure will give you more of the captured dab shape. I use this brush to add a quick texture overlay on a separate layer. Opacity is also linked to pen pressure, and I can take advantage of the merge mode to change how the color builds up upon itself. The pepper spray brush is next. This brush sprays out fine droplets of paint. You can control the size of the droplets using the feature property. This brush also uses clone tinting, which means that the source you have selected will affect the value of the paint. Or in other words, the droplets vary in brightness. You may want to select a less repetitive pattern to get the correct effect. Although the color picker is grayed out, when you hover over it, you will be able to select a color. This is a great brush for creating stars and pebbles. If you want the droplets to be a single color, just turn off clone color by pressing U on your keyboard or from the color picker. Next to that is pixel spray. I'll need to change to the basic paper. This brush also sprays out droplets of paint. 
but they are much finer at only one pixel in diameter. This brush works well for creating very fine textures like sand. I've converted this brush to a static bristle brush rather than a pixel airbrush, so you don't have to worry about it spraying out at an angle anymore. The pixel pattern will change if you change the paper. The last essential brush in the rendering category is the cylinder pen. This brush uses a gradient to create a multicolored stroke. I can choose the main to additional color gradient, and then choose a main and additional color. I'll select a light brown and a dark brown. And you can see that I'm able to use varied pressure to create tree branches that look three-dimensional. This saves you from having to add shading later with an airbrush. If the lighting on the cylinder shapes is not correct, you'll need to swap the main color for the additional color. That has moved the highlight to the bottom side of the branches. Let's take a look at some of my essential blenders. As you can see, you can get a lot of different looks out of the blenders, but I only use a handful of these variants on a regular basis. Diffuse Blur is one of them. We've played around with Diffuse Blur a little bit in earlier lessons. Using very light pressure allows you to slightly fuzz up the pixels. Heavy pressure really scatters the pixels. I use this brush to soften the edges of objects and make things look more distant. It can also work well for blending colors together with a drier appearance. The downside to using Diffuse Blur is that the plug-in method creates white fringe along the edges when you blend on a layer. Speckle Diffuse Blur can be used as an alternative to Diffuse Blur, since it's compatible with enhanced layer blending, and does not create white fringe. The strength of this brush controls how far you scatter the pixels, so to make the brush weaker, reduce the strength. While the blending effect is not identical, it does a decent job of scattering pixels in a similar way to Diffuse Blur. Next is Smooth Knife Blender, which mixes the paint to create intermediate colors as you blend. Brush size is linked to pressure, and the wedge-shaped dab creates bristly looking strokes with varied opacity. You can even change the angle of the dab using Pen Tilt. This brush utilizes fluid paint properties to enhance the opacity control, and you can modify the grain by changing the paper. This blender works well to emulate the look of traditional paint, and can be used in combination with the smooth palette knife. Next is Oily Blender. This is an oily looking blender that smudges around the paint more than it mixes colors together. Paper green can be used to add texture to the paint. If I choose small dots, which looks more like a canvas, and lower the scale, then it looks and feels more like I'm blending paint on a canvas. I can also choose a paper with more contrast, like contrasty random cracks, for a more dramatic texture when I blend. I'll set my paper back to basic paper. Next up is Coarse Oily Blender. This blender is using grain combined with a flow map dab stencil. I can change the texture of this brush by selecting different combinations of grain and dab stencil. Currently I'm getting the basic paper grain combined with the clouds flow map. But if I change my flow map to fine dots and the grain to fine dots, then I get dots within dots when I blend. This brush can be useful when you want to smudge more than blend while generating a complex texture. With the right combination of paper and dab stencil, it works well for blending mountains and other rough surfaces. Let's try another blender called Just Add Water. This blender emulates the effects of adding plain water to transparent media. It mixes colors together to create an intermediate color. The edges of the brush are wet and soft, which gives the blend a wet appearance. In addition to blending, this brush also features a bit of grain, so that the paint and water appear to interact with the surface you're working on. You can adjust this property to remove the grain if you like. However, to faithfully emulate the watercolor look, you'll need to use a watercolor paper and texture that match, such as cold pressed watercolor. But we will discuss that in a later lesson. For now, I will just show you how it looks on this painting that is already set up for watercolor. As you can see, this is not a watercolor brush, Yet it is compatible with watercolor layers, as well as default layers. Another useful brush is Blur. I'll increase the opacity of the Blur Blender to 
and I can use it to make the foreground out of focus. Lowering the strength makes the effect more subtle. This brush works well to add depth and distance to your scene. Near the bottom of the blenders are distortion brushes. These are not technically blenders, but they can mix up paint, which borders on blending. For example, I can use Hurricane to kind of swirl the paint together, which gives the impression of blending. If I mix for long enough, I will eventually create intermediate colors. While I don't use it for blending, the next brush is Bulge. This brush inflates the pixels outward in a spherical shape, which gives the effect of three-dimensional form. Bulge will eventually create a blend between two colors, but I mostly use it to correct mistakes and make small tweaks to objects in my composition. Pinch is the opposite of Bulge, and sucks pixels into the center of the cursor. Pinch does not blend color, rather it counteracts the effects of blending by sharpening pixels. While I mostly use Pinch alongside Bulge and Distorto to make adjustments in my paintings, it can also be useful for resharpening edges that you made too soft by blending. Pinch is also incredibly useful for reshaping the edges of objects. I'll demonstrate this technique in the final lesson of this course. So those are the essential blenders and distortion brushes. Let's explore a few of the important variants in my palette knives category. I'll be working on a blank canvas toned a light gray. Smooth Palette Knife is an excellent brush because it can add paint and blend at the same time. But if you apply paint, the brush eventually runs out of pigment and begins to blend the underlying colors. I love the way that I can lay down paint and then blend it out. It feels very natural. As you can see, I can create a shape and easily give it form by leveraging the painting and blending capabilities of this brush. Its counterpart is the Smooth Knife Blender, which we looked at earlier. The two brushes are nearly identical, except one is strictly a blender. Let's try the Mountain Knife. This is a great brush for painting the silhouettes of mountains that fade into mist. These variants are specialty palette knives that I use only on occasion. As you can see, some are oily, some have impasto, and some utilize grain and dab stencil. While Mountain Knife is one of the few variants that cannot be rotated, many can. If you own the Wacom Art Pen, palette knives can be incredibly useful. Being able to rotate a flat dab allows you to intuitively change the shape of your marks to get a wide range of effects, from tree trunks to water ripples. I also have some palette knives in my thick paint category, which we will explore next. Thick paint brushes can be useful if I want my painting to have a lot of paint depth, but these brushes work well even without any depth. Broken paint is the thick paint brush that I use the most. This is one of my favorite brushes because it gives me a paint break effect where the paint sticks to the canvas in some places and not in others. You can get a similar effect with a real palette knife and a light touch. In order for the effect to work properly, you'll have to select a paper with a lot of contrast. I can choose simulated wood grain and make sure the contrast and scale are turned up, or I can just choose one of my custom brush looks called knife break. I'm using light pressure to get that broken paint texture, but if I use heavy pressure, I can build up the paint. You can more easily see how the paint builds up if you increase the visible depth. If I use light pressure on the paint that has already been deposited, I can scrape the paint away, exposing more of the grain pattern. This brush is extremely versatile and can be used for mountains, rocks, trees, and more. Because this is a flat dab, I can change the angle of the brush if my pen supports tilt or rotation. My Wacom Art Pen supports rotation, so I can paint strokes that are thick, thin, and every angle in between. You can also load this brush with multiple colors, but we will come back to that in an upcoming lesson. If you paint with a saturated color, you may notice that the hue varies a bit throughout the stroke. If you want your paint to be a single color, you can choose the Broken Paint Flat variant, which is the same brush with less color variability. The remaining brushes in my thick paint category are specialty brushes that don't get used that often, but they are definitely worth experimenting with because they can give you some really unique effects. Beneath thick paint are some categories of specialty brushes that I only use when I want to create a specific look. I'll return to my light gray canvas. 
The oily category contains brushes that are using mostly liquid and drip, but also fluid paint to simulate oily looking effects. We'll be exploring this medium in its own section. So for now, I will just paint a few strokes with these variants so you can get a feel for the looks they can give you. Choosing a canvas paper will help these oil strokes look more convincing. There are a variety of shapes and effects. I use these brushes whenever I want an oily looking painting. They can also be combined with the oily blenders in my blenders category. Next is the nature category. These brushes are useful for creating landscape paintings. There are brushes that can create elements like clouds, pebbles, water lines, and foliage. The effects category is next. These are specialty brushes that can create miscellaneous effects. The brushes with icons that are black suggest that you paint on a dark canvas. I'll paint with a sampling of these brushes so you can see what they do. Next, we will look at the texture category. This is a collection of brushes that can create texture by utilizing green, dab stencil, impasto, or textures. These brushes work really well to quickly add detail to objects in your painting. There's also a category called hard media, which has a few charcoal, chalk, and pencil brushes that I use whenever I want that sort of look. Worn pencil is really good for creating a light shading with the side of your pencil using tilt. Let's move on to the inking category, which contains various ink brushes. Many of these brushes have a rough edge that helps the ink look more organic. There are also some brushes that create inking effects. I use this set of brushes when I'm creating line art illustrations. Beneath that, we have liquid ink brushes. These can be useful for creating drips and splatters of ink. And the final category in this palette drawer is watercolor. I don't do a whole lot of watercolor painting in Corel Painter. But when I do, this is a simple set of brushes that give me a decent range of effects. Located in their own palette drawer are my custom Imichose brushes. These are specialty brushes that can create repeating objects, patterns, and textures. These really come in handy when I need to add a lot of objects to create complexity. There are also packs of optional particle brushes that may come in handy for certain subjects. These are modular sets of brushes in box file format, so I just import and remove them as needed. These brush packs do not come pre-installed in my workspace and must be purchased separately. To give you an example of how I might use them, if I'm doing a nature painting, I might select some brushes from the Thick Paint Compatible Foliage Brush Pack. This makes it easy to paint grass blades or leaves on a tree. Or here is the Hairy Brush Pack, which can be used to create a variety of hair and fur effects. This pack is immensely valuable for painting wildlife and pet portraits. That covers the brushes that I consider to be essential to my workflow. By now you should have a pretty good idea of how to use my custom workspace and brushes. The next step is to check out some of my free tutorials or paid courses to make use of this workspace.